fact. All right, everybody, welcome to the Comic Book Showcase on YouTube. We're excited to bring you guys yet another wonderful episode. It is my birthday right now, and I am very drunk, and I am living out a dream I have had for a long time. For the longest time, I have wanted us to do an episode where we drunkenly reviewed the first appearance of Batman in Detective Comics number 27. This episode is called Drunk Detective Comics number 27 for that reason. Uh, I'm pretty drunk right now. I've been, it's my birthday. Uh, I finished about like you know, like half to a third of this bottle of Sailor Jerry's. I'm feeling very nice right now. Uh, we're going to talk about the first appearance of Batman. Do you guys want to introduce yourself? I forget how we introduce ourselves. Uh, so I'll introduce myself next, just because uh, I feel like it. Uh, so I am Jamie Hart. I'm the founder of the Marvel DC Databases, and I'm here because Billy is awesome, and this topic is awesome, and let's give her. I'm eating my birthday cake. I'll go <laughs> next. I'm Rab, and I'm an administrator on the DC Database, and I'm the only one who's not drunk because I I don't drink but I am drinking this weird homemade root beer that my dad got for me. And that I is... am eating leftover cake for my birthday, which was last weekend. Rab, stop trying to make this about you. Um, <laughs> that is completely, completely acceptable. Rab is our designated driver for the evening. And Kyle. I'm Kyle, and I'm an administrator on the DC database, and I'm one of only... Two other people that are drinking. So, all right. Let's all right. So, I have no idea how this night is going to work out. It could be amazing. It could be terrible. My hope, uh, in the spirit of Chris Gethard, one of my favorite comedians, is that if it is terrible, it goes all the way over to the other side and becomes so terrible that it is then again entertaining to watch again. Um, I'm very excited about this. I hope that we can do more episodes like this in the future. I Drunk appearance is the first appearance of Batman. That's I'll do anything. I'll do uh, first appearance of Thor on Ecstasy. I'll do next week, Amazing Fantasy number 15, first appearance of Spider-Man on Crystal Map. I'll be here. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the Detective Comics number 27... It starts out, we're just going to, let's just break down the story first of all for everybody. It starts off with, uh, with Bruce Wayne and Jim Gordon sitting in the, with the Gordon's apartment together, just smoking pipes and sitting in their chairs, and immediately I have so many questions about these two people. Uh, Bruce, like, they don't have anything to talk, there's no reason for Bruce Wayne to be there. He's just like, oh, anything going on recently? Any, anything exciting happening to you? Commissioner and Jim Gordon says he says oh nothing except this Batman fellow puzzles me so he's like like oh yeah no there's nothing really going on oh right except there's a guy dressed up like a bat and goes around solving all of our crime sports and murdering people I forgot to mention that's a thing that's been going on um and then Jim Gordon he get what sorry it's been going on in the back of his mind he's not like it's just like Oh, nothing's going on. Oh, wait, Batman. No, oh, but nothing. He's like, excuse me, I have a re-election to deal with. Um, <laughs> and then Jim Gordon gets a call on the phone that there's been a murder. And immediately, I have no idea what kind of relationship he has with Bruce Wayne, but immediately he's like, hey, Bruce Wayne, you want to go see a dead body? Like, they're not, they're not talking about I don't know why. That does not give us any reason why they're friends. But Bruce Wayne does decide. He's like, oh, yeah, no, sure. I Nothing else to do. Might as well. Oh, yeah, I'd be cool to see a murder, Jim Gordon. Not that I'm into that kind of stuff. Um, I, I got I to gotta ask. I got to ask. What fucking protocols in 1939 are broken by the commissioner of the police going, hey, Mr. Socialite Bruce Wayne, let's go to a crime scene, like, mid-investigation. Like, what protocols are being broken here? Oh, and I, just for the viewers at home, I should make a couple of fucking warnings here. A, there may or may not be some fucking expletives in this. And B, if you've not read it already, there's some... Spoiler alert. Spoiler uh, alert. I'm going to ruin the shit out of this story for you. You've had <laughs> 75 years to read it. Fuck you. That's what i got to say. Yeah. I feel, I feel bad for anybody who has... I apologize if I gave away the first three panels of Detective Comics number 27. Um, 
It uh, breaks no protocols. Because he's like, he's the commissioner. He rules the roost. He can do whatever he wants all the time. Jim Gordon is just strolling into crime scenes all the time. People are telling him not to do things, and he's like, "What? No, I just I brought a bunch of strippers. I got nobody can tell me what to do." Phone calls at Bruce Wayne's house. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Jamie um, said he's running for re-election. So what's the, what's a better way to get donations than bringing the richest guy in Gotham with you to see a dead body? Exactly. So there's so there's been a murder, uh, Lambert. The no first name given chemical king of Gotham City has been found dead in his apartment. And the only suspect is his son, whose fingerprints were found on the knife. Um. Uh, what? And that, so then the, uh, it turns out, like, the son didn't do And Bruce Wayne is just like, oh, yeah, you're like, you guys got. I'm just going to go home to do uh, wealthy socialite things. Something, something, lady, and then he he ducks out for unexplained reason. We don't know, and that's no, we don't know who Bruce Wayne is yet at this point. We just think Bruce Wayne is a boring, unexplained character who's just like Jim Gordon's buddy who follows him around. Um, so there's a there's a second murder that Jim Gordon receives a phone call about. This guy Lambert is involved in a chemical syndicate. The story is called The Case of the Chemical Syndicate. And at the, the next guy's house, Stephen Crane, that guy gets murdered also immediately. Uh, and Batman shows up on the roof to confront the two murderers. Whoa, whoa, whoa okay. Before, before you get there, I think you've missed a lot of key plot details. Like, yeah. when Gordon shows up at the first fucking house, the first thing he says to the key suspect is, Hey, how's it going? Um, so I hear you killed your dad. <laughs> <laughs> he just drops that bomb, like, casually, like, hey, what's up? You killed your dad. So how's that going for you? How's that working out? Like, like, the short, they get right to the point with this one. They say you killed your father. Yeah, he's, he's very just pedestrian about it. Like, and not, not even, he's not even, doesn't even sound like disappointed. Just like a principal, like, all right, tell me what's going on. And the, the other thing, that, the other thing that gets me about the, the the quick introduction to the first crime scene is like, uh, so we've done an on this is 1939. Keep this in mind. We've we've done an on-site fingerprint analysis, and we've realized that you are the prime suspect because your fingerprints were on the knife. And so we've done all this forensic analysis, but we haven't questioned you yet. We haven't actually asked you, did you do it? Nobody questions him until the commissioner by. himself gets to the crime scene. Oh, the commissioner is our best detective. That's why he's. That's why he handles everything. We don't solve any crimes until the commissioner gets here. Um. But so, uh, Batman, he gets to the next murder scene, and immediately, I, I'm like very sympathetic to these cops who don't like Batman at first. Uh, he catches the two guys on the roof, and he's. He doesn't even talk to them. He just beats the shit out of them and then throws one guy off a roof. And it, no questioning, literally no dialogue in that scene other than those guys being like, oh, fuck, what's going on? And he does it like right in front of the, the cops roll up and Batman is throwing a dude off the roof at that second. Um, oh, what else is going on in that scene? Uh, oh, and, and then afterwards he like reads the slip of paper that he stole from them. And he's like, oh, I think I figured out who the murderer is. Yeah, Batman, why did you just fucking ask the guys? Why did you have to steal the paper after you murdered them? Would have been so easy. Uh, and, and then he drives off, and this is another thing I think is very funny about these early stories. There was no Batmobile at this point in 1939. They had not, I don't, the technology wasn't there yet, but Batman is just driving around in Bruce Wayne's car. If you yeah, look at that, it is, like it's a sick car though. It is so I would drive that car. They're all oh, sick cars. Definitely. But, but that that's it's on the first page. That is just Bruce Batman is just driving around, casually cruising around town in untinted windows in Bruce Wayne's automobile with Bruce Wayne's license plate. 
In all fairness, it's not like they have license plate recognition or some stuff. Like it's like a nineteen thirty nine like Duesenbaker or something like a doozy, and they they may or may pro they probably don't have seatbelts in that thing. Like it has headlights. Yes, it has headlights. That is about it. I, I like the image of a Batman who. Like, his Batmobile doesn't have it. And instead of, like, Ninja Caltrops, I press the button. He has to, like, he just has, like, a uh, a bucket of nails lying next to him on the seat. And he just has to dump it out the window. <laughs> Super low-tech Batman. He doesn't care. He's got his shit figured out. Um, and then the the next guy in the chemical syndicate, uh, Fred, Fred, is it Fred Rogers? Oh, man, I'm behind on this. I think it's, I think it's Rogers, yeah, yeah. Is yeah, he, but he, is he in the chemical syndicate or is he like some unwitting hap though? Paul like, Rogers. He's, he's, he's Paul he's, Rogers, which is just as bad. Paul <laughs> Rogers and Fred Rogers—they're both people who exist. Birthday <laughs> cake. Mm. <laughs> I feel left out that my birthday wasn't this week, guys. Well, yeah, Kyle. I didn't want to say anything, Kyle, but we've all been thinking about that this entire time. Um, I know, I don't have any birthday cake, and I'm a little we, upset. Yeah, we've all been thinking about how out of place you are in this conversation, and to be honest, it's making the rest of us very uncomfortable also. I don't um, want to be here anymore. I don't, even, I don't even want to be a part of this conversation. Okay. Uh, and, and so then, then the Paul Rogers, the, final, the third member of the Chemical Syndicate, goes to visit Alfred Stryker. His, his dear friend, his, oh, somebody's murdering every, oh, every one of us. And then that guy's henchman, uh, it turns out that guy is evil. But instead of just murdering him in a normal person way, he knocks him out and then play, he puts it, what is it's like a guinea pig murder chamber? It's a giant glass case with nerve gas. So it's like this elaborate death trap that descends slowly from above while you're only tied by your hands. You could roll out from under it, but you choose not to, so you just wait for death from above. Yeah, but no, it's not... I, tied I, to the floor, though. Isn't he tied I, to the floor? No, he's, he's not tied, tied from above. He's just, like it. just sitting Is there. Is that like a belt? <laughs> That's, we'll, ne we'll never know what the, what the original writers uh, intended. <laughs> um, but... He, I, what I love about this so much is that any other elaborate death trap, I like, I respect. Like when Doctor Doom builds a crazy death trap, he's put time and scientific expertise into the fact that it's a slow death mechanism that you can theoretically think your way out of, and not just shoot him. And this guy has no reason not to just shoot the student in the head. I don't know why he's committed to using nerve gas, but he, it's like he had to, he, like he knew. Oh, I, I want to kill this guy slowly uh, with nerve gas for no reason, and then just had to throw things that he had lying around. But I don't want to be here to see you die. I want to leave yeah. quickly before it descends on you. Maybe that's it. It's just a very awkward situation for him. It's, he just says, like, oh, yeah, no, oh, sorry. No, I'm not going to, oh, and he just, like, feels, it's like when a homeless person is asking you for change. These people begging on the nerve gas canister. Um, just a very awkward situation for him. And then Batman bursts in through the skylight. And Batman uh, runs inside the nerve gas thing and picks up a wrench and smashes it out because Batman's putting himself in personal danger. He plugs yeah. it with a hanky first. He gets yes. a hanky and plugs the gas and then breaks it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did miss that. Um... Does he keep the hanky? Like, is that the first use of the utility belt? Is to keep and it's the first, <laughs> the first thing we've ever seen in Batman's utility belt is a dainty handkerchief that he uses to plug a pipe. Oh, I never thought about that. Good, good, good eye, Kyle. Um, you need a page for the bat hanky. Yeah, bat hanky. <laughs> I'll get on that immediately because I am not done writing up this article. Um, <laughs> So then, so then Batman, he gets out, and he beats the shit out of this guy, and then Alfred Stryker, the true villain of our piece, who's been orchestrating these events like a puppet master the entire time, that guy walks up, and he doesn't, see, he doesn't know Batman is there, because Batman lives in the shadows. And sometimes it says that Batman's just accidentally hanging out in the corner, like, oh, what stuff's going on? Um, 
But then Paul Rogers explains it, and Alfred Stryker is like, oh, you survived? I'll have to kill you with the knife right now. Uh, and then Batman beats the shit out of that guy. Out. And then this, this is the most controversial moment of the story. This is the part that everybody talks about. Batman, he delivers, Batman delivers his exposition monologue and explains how he knew it was Alfred Stryker. And then Alfred Stryker, he says, uh, sure, I did it, but you won't send me to the chair for this. I'll... And he, like, kind of tries to push Batman away. And then Batman just, bam, punches him in the face over a railing to his death. There's a, a vat of acid. That's a horrible way to die. And Batman clearly intentionally punches this guy over the railing and murders him. And then his only comment is, a fitting end for his kind. And then he leaps out of the skylight. He does not give a shit that that guy just died. In fact, he takes a small amount of pleasure in it, I think. No, this, this whole, this this whole comic. The, yeah, the, this Batman is not the, the Batman we all know and love. This is not the guy that's like, I won't kill that guy. Like, don't use guns. He's like, I will punch your ass into a vat of acid because conveniently there is a vat of acid in the basement of a mansion of a rich guy that is negotiating a contract of some ill repute that we don't fully understand that is never quite explained that just happens to be the semi-half-assed plot for this entire story. <laughs> I don't care about any of that. Well, How can he jump out the skylight? He just jumps up. That it is, that he does not have a bat rope at this point. He just jumped all the way upwards through a ceiling window and is seems to be gliding upwards into the night. Um, Are you questioning the logistics of Batman? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Batman, he is so easy. And it's not just he's like, like, oh my god, I murdered. He's so like chill and down with murders in this issue, which I kind of love. Uh, even earlier, uh, if we could get that panel running up again, uh, when he throws those dudes off the roof, you see him afterwards in his car. And he has this creepy smile on his face like, like I've totally got half a bat boner right now. Uh, he he loves murdering these dudes. I do love bat boners. I do I do love <laughs> bat boners. That I would say that's probably seventy five percent of what I'm thinking about at any given time. So when um, so, when, so hold, hold on hold on. Oh excuse me hold on. So yes, when Jamie. he says when he's when he figures out who the bad guy is he's the comic says uh, he reads the whatever. Uh, a grim smile comes to his lips. Like, he, he is fucking... He's happy as a clam Spike. that he's figured this shit out. And when he punches someone... This is fucking classic. Mm -hmm. When he punches the bad guy off the first... Of the, he's on the roof fighting the bad guys. It says, um... Uh, he punches them into space. <laughs> Yeah, man, Batman doesn't give a fuck. I, I That's just what like you that. get for breaking the law. I just like that last scene where he, like, the bad guy's like, "Sure, I did it, but you won't see me, or you won't send me to the chair for it." I'll, I'll. And Batman's just like, "Sock, sock." That's that my favorite doesn't... part. I like <laughs> that part. That guy doesn't even make it to the end of his sentence. He gets. He's not even finished with his thought. He's like, oh, but if I escape, he doesn't even finish. He doesn't even say the word escape. Does not get to the word escape, and then Batman is already like, no, boop, damn, murdered. Batman doesn't need to hear that. He's heard it before, surely. Yeah. Don't call me Shirley. Probably. All right. Uh, so, so that's. Uh, oh, this this was something that was brought up earlier. We are, this issue is about Detective Comics number 27. We are only discussing the Batman story. We are not discussing the other Detective Comics anthology stories, such as Speed Saunders in The Killers of Kurdistan or Buck Marshall in Bullet Bluff. I wait, wait, we didn't, even finish, we didn't finish the story yet, though. No, we didn't? Oh, yeah, no, you were right. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Okay, um... So he jumped out of the skylight, like just up into space, and then there's no, there's more panels. Yeah, and then later on that night, uh, Jim Gordon and Bruce Wayne are hanging out, 
and Jim Gordon is like, oh yeah, this Batman guy is hanging out. And I mean, like, I get he uh, he threw it, uh, he threw a dude to his death right in front of police officers. But that's, I mean, he helped us solve a murder. And if there's one thing I believe about crime, it's that it is a math. It's just one for one. Um, you kill somebody, you save somebody. That's it's an even slate. Uh, and then Bruce Wayne is like, yeah, whatever, nerd. I I don't. I've never heard of that. And Jim Gordon, he, he, he lights his cigar because it, he also has he, multiple <laughs> multiple tobacco consumption methods in this issue in one night. Camp Peck. And he, uh, Bruce Wayne is a nice young chap, but he certainly must lead a boring life. Seems disinterested in everything. And then that they have that moment at the end where there's a, there's a picture of a door creaking open, and I can feel the dramatic... Bah, 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 bah. Bruce Wayne is the Batman! And that's the dramatic reveal at the end of the decision. If I had read this in 1930-whatever, or 40-whatever, I probably wouldn't have picked up the next issue. <laughs> I, do, I wonder if there were people at the time who were like, oh my god, Bruce Wayne was Batman? Like, that blew their minds. Like, three pages earlier. Like, honestly, four, like, three or four pages earlier, a guy that had three panels that was like, yeah, cool, yeah, can't join you, see you later, and suddenly he's the big reveal. Like Bruce Wayne, but he's a playboy who's disinterested in everything. What possible motivations could he have? He agrees to come along to cry to crime scenes and then goes ho hum. That was boring. <laughs> uh, more dead bodies. Mm. Not that it wasn't boring. What with all that very expository explanation from Young Lambert, as he's called, because they couldn't be bothered to think up a first name for old. Could not be. <laughs> could not be bothered to give either of those characters a first name. But I like how Young Lambert is like, he's like the, the equivalent of a witness on like a Law and Order now, where it's just like, yeah, I saw that guy. <laughs> and there was that other suspicious thing. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> I only remember two d very important details. Yeah, um, yeah this, uh, I, I don't know if you guys are interested in the history lesson here. But this uh, this issue also is is like one of the most retold stories in comic book history. I've been writing an article on it, and they've they've retold Case of the Chemical Syndicate like five six times. And the uh, my least favorite of those is in the eighties. Roy Thomas decided to do like a rebooted origin story of Golden Age Batman, and he retells this story. But in his version, he didn't want to have Batman kill somebody but he still wanted to remain faithful. So I instead, at the end, uh, Alfred Stryker, when he's escaping, is like, like I won't go to the electric here. You'll never catch me. And he, he's, he's run away, and he just trips over a railing before he even finishes his sentence. So he, he gets, he's like, he, like, he pushes Batman, and he's like, you'll never catch me. Oh! Not, not even three steps away into his escape, trips over a uh, waist length railing into a vat of acid and dies a horrible death. That is a fitting death if you're that stupid. It's like, it's a fitting death for this stupid guy who trips over his own feet. Yeah, that, Batman, he still says a fitting end for his kind, and the tone is kind of like, a, I guess, yeah, it makes sense. Like, Batman's kind of confused about it. Like, oh, that was weird. I don't know why he did that. Uh, he, he works in this building. You'd think that he would know the basics. Um, who is they and they they did a, a 60s Silver Age version of the story, which where they they tried to cut out as much death as possible, and the first two guys die. Uh, but Alfred Stryker gets away at the end, and Batman is just like, I hope you learned your lesson, chum. Um, and that one is it's more about like generational conflict, and the younger Lambert guy. He's, he's like a mixture between like 60s Woodstock hippies and what DC Comics writers think that motorcycle riders are like. So he, he's this totally nonsensical like easy rider type who strolls into Gotham 
and gets into an argument with Robin about how authority figures are always bringing him down. Can Wait, Batman teach Robin him that authority figure? Oh, yeah, in the in the sixty, it's uh, it's like a Silver Age version, and Batman Batman teaches young Lambert that sometimes authority figures are there to help you, and the whole time Robin is just like, I fucking hate this hippie. He did it. He's the murderer. I want to take him down. And it's uh, the whole issue is Batman going like Robin. You need to chill the fuck out. Uh, this guy is into different. He has long hair. That doesn't mean he's a Nazi. Robin hates that guy. But why is Robin such a Nazi? <laughs> I, I, which I kind of like the idea that because uh, everybody talks about how Batman is basically like a fascist wet dream. And I like the idea that Robin would be kind of growing up on that and, and only picking up that, like, very shallow perspective on it. Like, oh, like, oh yeah, like anybody who's against the system needs to be put in prison. And that's just the only thing he's picked up from Batman. And Batman has to be like, holy shit, I'm raising the Hitler youth right now. What have I done? Um, who was, and then the, they, did another, they did a reboot of it in the 90s that had... Uh, the '90s reboot isn't even worth talking about. And then I also thought they very recently in the New Fifty Two did a reboot where they have Alfred Stryker get pushed into the vat of acid, and then it turns out that he becomes the Joker, which is kind of a cool way to bring this thing full circle and bring it into the rest of the. Because there's no reason this story needs to be uh, needs to keep being retold. It's been retold like five or six times, and it's a dog shit story. It's not a good story that I want to read over and over again. It's, it's not even an original story, if you guys aren't aware. Uh, very famously, it's almost identical to the plot of an old uh, Shadow pulp comic. A pulp comic about the Shadow. And they just, like, blatantly ripped it off. And Only the Shadow comes gone. Yeah. There's very few things that are older than 1939 that are referenceable way. The I want to know how did barely. Detective Comics make it 26 issues before they they got Batman? Like, what was <laughs> going on in Detective that was like so popular that they got this far? Cosmo, the Phantom of Disguise. <laughs> Your answer still, is more fun than mine. <laughs> I have no idea who Cosmo, the Phantom of Disguise, is, but he lasted at least 27 issues of Detective Comics, and I know that if I actually found out who Cosmo, the Phantom of Disguise, really is, it would be disappointing. Because he can't be as awesome as I think he's going to be. But I like to dream. Phantom of Disguise. Oh no, it sounds really good now that you say that. He's a phantom and he's good at disguises. Like, if you're a phantom, why do you even need a disguise? Like, what's but going he's, on? He's not a phantom, though. He's just like a normal dude who wears disguises. And the word phantom is thrown in there to make it jazzy. That sounds uh, a lot less exciting. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've skimmed it. Uh, so, I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Like, there are some things... Uh, this issue is remarkable in some ways. Because there are a lot of things that you do... You read it and you're like, like, holy shit, like, there's Batman. This is 1939, the first appearance. But you really are going all the way back and seeing the beginnings of these incredible things that we know and love now. But in other ways, it, it feels so like weird and foreign and different, um, like a like a totally different person than what we have today. And there has, there's been a lot of evolution over the years. Well, you say different person, but there's like no person. Bruce Wayne and ba I mean Batman has no personality in this in this story. It's just. Guy shows up, punches a bunch of people. He knows the reasons, and then he goes away. And he's Bruce does he Wayne. Does he actually say anything other than a fit again for his? Okay, I'm I'm looking through it, and he he says the exposition. He says like, "This is why I had to kill this guy," and then I'm killing this guy, and that's all he explains to anybody throughout the entire thing. Yep. But uh, I I think. It's important to note that when we complain about him killing people in this issue or in this story, it's not because, well, we complain that he kills people, but this comes before they actually tell the story of how he became Batman. So he could have had any origin prior to this, prior to this moment in Batman history. 
Yeah, and you, you you do see a lot of those like Pulp Hero origins in this. Where I don't, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. It was like five or six months down the line when they finally gave him. Yeah, Detective Comics number thirty three is where they give him that excellent origin story with his parents getting murdered. At this point, he's just, it's like he's running. He's just basically the Punisher. It almost reads more like a Punisher comic. He only kills three guys. He throws one guy off the roof. He punches a guy into space. And he throws a guy into acid. I, I think those two guys from the roof survived. They just fell onto the ground from like... Well, the guy that got thrown into space probably suffocated. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably dead. Like, when the Justice League builds their satellite in like 30 years, He's floating around up there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's we'll, we'll we'll never know what what the uh, what the founding fathers really intended. Unless unless like from like three years from now, Jeff Johns is like, hey, remember that character that got punched off the roof into space? He's back, and now he's fucking double lightning man or what? <laughs> <laughs> double lightning. The the Justice League's new greatest villain of all time, double lightning man. I w- th- what's embarrassing is how much I would love to read the shit out of that comic. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot I of like, stuff. Uh, I like that they call this this thing that was stolen from Rogers or who no from the other guy who died. They call it the paper. It has <laughs> whatever it is. It's just the paper. I got I got to I got to know like picks up the paper. I I I got to know like. It's like a fucking mysterious contract that so these four guys enter this secret contract that nobody will know about, including their own children, and it's like, uh, it's like somehow they owe money. Yeah, but it's like, no, hold on, hold on. It's like um, this piece of paper because I'm holding it is like worth millions of fucking dollars or some shit, and it's like because I've stolen, <laughs> I killed your ass, and I've stolen this paper. Therefore, it's kosher now. Like this, this, this mysterious contract is all you have to do is kill the guy, and just like suddenly you're worth millions of dollars or something. I I don't get this contract. Yeah, I, not 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 a lot of foresight in the murder me and win millions of dollars contract. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like a tontine, though. You know what a tontine is, where like you all have like a a stash of money, and then whoever dies last gets to keep all the money, which is a really dumb idea, because then you're like 80, and then you all have, and then everybody gets murdered, which is why tontines are illegal now. Is but, that a like, Canadian word, Rob? Is that Canadian? I feel like I've heard of that on Archer. Yeah, I've heard of that on Archer. That's it doesn't sound about. like an American word to me. It's like a wartime thing, when people yeah. would go into, like, Germany and then steal a bunch of gold and then be like, all right, now the five of us have gold, and we're going to, like, have this gold, and whoever dies last wins it. Is that, and gets... Everybody kills each other every time. I, I feel <laughs> like I saw that in Shawshank Redemption. Is that right? Is that Shawshank Redemption? All right, we're, we're getting a little bit off topic here. Um... Let's talk about guinea pigs and experiments. <laughs> yeah, this that guy... guy that... <laughs> His mechanism, his gigantic death trap, he says it's originally used to kill guinea pigs. That thing is huge for killing guinea pigs! How many guinea pigs is he killing at one time? He's got to have, like, like 20 or 30 of them, and he's just dumping them inside in a cardboard box. We need more guinea pigs to shovel into our fire. That's the only energy system we have in 1939. And I want to know, like, did he see this coming? Did he see this random guy breaking into his house being tied up, and then just sitting there, waiting t- for a glass jar to come down over his head. It's like, yeah, I'll plan for that. Uh, that's that's so a plausible scenario. I, I better install these seatbelts on my floor for future merch. <laughs> Yet yeah, nobody in the first time somebody sees those seatbelts. <laughs> Specifically, there are seatbelts built into yeah. the floor for just this purpose. Or maybe he... I also assumed it was for the guinea pigs. I mean... If you put a guinea pig on the floor, he's not probably going to just sit there and let the gas chamber hit him. Yeah, you need a seatbelt for that guinea pig. What What confuses me about this is that he says, it's for, I use it to kill guinea pigs to experiment with. Like, 
First he kills them, then he experiments. <laughs> Only on de- well, his uh, his his best his best friend when he was a child was a guinea pig, and he has dedicated his life to bringing that that guinea pig back to life. It's just lying in a block of ice in his freezer, and that that's the real tragedy is that Batman, at the end of the story, separates this young boy from ever bringing his his pet back to life. I believe you. Yeah. He just ends uh, up like falling over inside the hole of his thing. Oh, That's... Captain, my guinea pig. Oh, Captain, my guinea pig. All right. I can feel this conversation uh, devol- devolving into a drunken mess. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to watch this on my birthday. You have no idea how happy that makes me. Uh, this, if you are interested, seriously, if you're interested in hearing us talk about more number one issues, uh, I'm actually planning a side podcast where I will be reviewing a lot of other number one issues first appearances uh, with some of my other friends. If you are interested, I don't know how much of it is going to be this drunk, but that's up to you to decide. Please leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this video. Tell us uh, what your opinions are on the story. If you read it, other things you'd like us to review or talk about. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Have a good night. One more time. I'm Billy Arrowsmith. I'm Jamie Harry. I'm Rab Townsend. And I'm Kyle Theobald. All right, you guys are wonderful. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks, all. Take care. Cool.